Joining us on the program today, Ben Wright, writer for the internet. Um, ben, All of the internet. Ben, ben yep. uh, lots of stuff to get to today. Ben, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, guys. Thanks for having me on. Well, are you a new Are you a new soccer outlet in somewhere in America and need a writer? <laughs> ben is Ben is apparently working for most of them right now. So if you'd like to add Ben to your lineup, please, please, please contact him at Ben Wright. Yes, and run it by my wife first. <laughs> yes, and and all eleven children. Uh, no, we've got a 14 lot of stuff, now. About fourteen. That's good, uh, man. You guys work quick. Uh, listen, a lot of stuff to get to with you today on the show. Of course, the Nashville SC has a brand new uh, coach. Of course, we'll get to that. What does that mean for this organization? And certainly, fans who have par- who maybe are parachuting in now because of the new coach. What what has happened this year, and what will happen moving forward? We'll get into that. Of course, all of your new jobs, your new gigs. We can also talk gold medal championship for our girls as well we can get into that some of the olympic stuff and maybe because i know you'll be covering this what the hell is going to happen over the next two seasons uh, or two calendar years for the u.s men's national team as the world cup is coming to our great country before we do of course a reminder everybody that we are brought to you by eighth and roast our great and lo- amazing and local sponsor four great locations across the city and buy those beans at a grocery store near you check the local section of your national conglomerate you get that Check the local se- section of your national grocery store conglomerate, and you'll be able to buy those eighth and roast beans. Best co- cup of coffee you'll get in the city. Uh, okay, Ben, let's start with sort of if you're parachuting in as a fan, and I, I will admit I've been to about a third to a half of the games as a season ticket holder for Nashville SC. Uh, it's It's been an easy season, and especially an easy last few months, to sort of fade out uh, when all these things are happening, summer you know, vacation, et cetera, et cetera. So what is taking place in in the last two months with Nashville SC? Yeah, I think really the only way to describe it is just a reset. Um, look, I so obviously they they fired Gary Smith back in um, May, April, February. I don't know. It, it was a while ago. No, it was back in feels May. feels like a um, year ago. <laughs> it feels like so much longer than it was. Um, weirdly, yeah. it was after a win, which I've never seen in MLS. Um, but they've been underperforming. Dead, dead. Dead cat bounce. Can't have the dead cat bounce. So. Exactly. Well, I, I, yeah, we can get into that later. I have I have some uh, speculation on that. Um, <laughs> but Gary Smith was a really good coach for them at first. And I don't think anybody like I, I think there are some ma- people who were frustrated w- with where the team was that maybe tried to paint it in a in a much more negative light. He was a great expansion coach. He brought a lot of stability. He kept their defense solid. He got them into the playoff every year that they've been around turned honey Mokhtar into a from a from a number eight into an mvp level attacker a lot of good stuff it just was it was time to move on and he'd been there for seven years and regardless of what you think of him as a coach time just kind of runs out eventually messaging becomes stale yada 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 nashville decided it was the best time to move on they bring in bj callahan who i think everybody in u.s soccer is pretty high on him as a coach just from his from his experience with Philadelphia Union with the U.S. national team, he was obviously the interim head coach for the U.S. national team during the whole Greg Berhalter uh, blackmail with the Reynas investigation, all of that stuff. One um, won a CONCACAF Nations League and I think really kind of played pretty attacking soccer, even more attacking soccer than we saw under Berhalter. So he had a lot of goodwill from that. Nashville, I think, probably made the change when they did because they wanted to be the first team to, to really have a shot at him. Um, and so under Callahan, they're trying to be more possession based. They want to be more proactive and less reactive because they were pretty, pretty darn reactive under Gary Smith at times. Um, but I think even more importantly than on the field, which is obviously like paramount, they want to kind of just align the entire organization that Nashville SC, their MLS next pro team, Huntsville city FC, and then their Academy, they want to have all of it kind of functioning together under the same philosophy, under the same principles of play. Um, and really just aligning it so that they can actually develop players because in all over the world, developing players is arguably the, the, besides winning. That's arguably the second most important thing a team can do. Nashville had done it pretty terribly um, under Gary Smith. They were hardly playing any players under 23, 24 years old. No one from the Academy was really pushing forward into the first team. And, and so under Callahan, they're trying to align it all and really develop a pretty clear path pathway from their Academy team through Huntsville, through the first team. And you're already starting to see that. Um, and I, I think it's just really kind of a more modern approach. Um, and they, they've called it Nashville SC 2.0. And I think it's a pretty fair way to describe it. 
Callahan gets to town. Uh, what is your impression of kind of how he has interacted with people, with the media? What is your what is what is your kind of like initial personal impression of him having talked to him a couple of times now? I've been like completely blown away. Um, he's been, I mean, first of all, I've been able to talk to him just kind of off the record a, a few times and he's just super friendly. Um, he's like actually interested in getting to know people covering the team. Um, he, yeah, very personable with the media. He's, he's super thoughtful. Um, I think we were a little bit spoiled with Gary Smith because you could ask him one question and get a five minute response and pretty much write a full story off of one question. Um, and, and Callahan's not far which off is, from that. Like, which is, which is good because sometimes, the, uh, because, because sometimes the uh, team only lets you ask one question. So yeah, no, it, it makes, it makes my job easy and it's definitely a, a easy way to get content. Um, and, and Callahan is pretty close to like, he's not just giving you, kind of terse non-answers um he's not trying to avoid questions he'll actually like go into the weeds with you tactically um he'll explain kind of his thought process um yeah he's been, he's been super open um he's really spent a lot of time like just kind of trying to not educate the media but really get them up to speed on his vision for the team um how he wants them to play, like getting into the weeds of how he wants to play and i think that's really important um because a lot of times with not just with Gary Smith, but with other coaches that I, I cover around the league, they almost are frustrated at you if you don't understand what they're trying to do, but then won't actually explain what they're trying to do. And, and so it's like, how can I, how can I do a good job? Like telling fans what you're trying to do if you won't even tell me. Um, so I, I think Callahan definitely understand. He he's talked about wanting to get like how, how Nashville's fan base is already pretty educated in terms of soccer and he wants to like play to that. And, and so I think he's done everything right initially, just in terms of um, being good with media, but also trying to like really make sure fans um, are in the know as to like what actually he's trying to do and have like actual um, reference points on the field to see the progress that he's making because he's, I mean, he's, he's been clear. It's not like a short-term fix. It's going to take, the rest of this season and into 2025. And, and so I think as long as he kind of um, sets the tone right early on, and I think he's doing that, but I, I think he's kind of setting himself up for maybe longer term success or at least longer term goodwill among the fans. It sort of sounds like the uh, other Callahan in town. If we can get a, a third Callahan running the Preds organization, that'd be great. Um, what I think is interesting, first of all, when is a loss not really a loss, Ben? <laughs> That's a, Yeah. I think that was like maybe the one time when a loss is not really a loss because the league's cup is weird. Um, but yeah, technically a draw and then penalties are separate, but whatever. You, you right. asked a perfectly, perfectly fine okay, question for, from, from you my asked perspective, a perfectly fine question from my perspective. They lost in penalties and were eliminated from a tournament. So, I mean, <laughs> if it's not a technical loss, it's definitely a moral loss. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but, I think it counts as both. <laughs> yeah. But, but, they, st you know, the Leaks Cup in general. I think we got spoiled by it last year because they went on this like kind of weird run, uh, which, in hindsight, they didn't necessarily play spectacularly, but they kept grinding out these results. Mm -hmm. And so it comes back around, and everybody's everybody's attitude towards it this year was just get us out of this tournament, <laughs> please, yeah. please. Let us have a few weeks off and let the new coach have time to to interact with the players. Don't let them, you know, don't send them off to Salt Lake on a uh, on a Thursday night. I think there was definitely some proximity bias last year, just because I mean I was in the stadium for all, but I think the Cincinnati game where they were out of town. Um, so I mean you were like right there watching it. I think the other thing too, just for kind of the league as a whole, I mean it was messy kind of showing up in MLS. So I feel like there was a much broader interest, yeah. and now it just, I mean. I, maybe this is what everybody felt like last year, but I, I think it's more than that. I, I think it's just kind of worn off a little bit and it just doesn't, it doesn't feel nearly as kind of uh, in, enthralling as it did last season. So I'm curious. Cause you, you say that, that coach BJ Callahan has like a, you know, he, th he thinks pretty highly of the market. Uh, obviously I think the state of Tennessee is a better soccer state, probably at the youth level than people realize. Um, I'm, I'm curious because the old question about soccer in Nashville was like, how much do you need to educate the common fan and bring them along and sort of include them and wrap your arms around them while also trying to cater content that's really high level and smart to the, uh, to the diehards who love the, love the game. And I find it interesting the last couple of months, what that's done to our fan base, because 
it feels like we took a lot of steps forward as a city, understanding MLS in particular. Um, the World Cup conversation certainly added sort of some some attention to that as well. But then you you go into what is clearly the worst, let's say, six to eight weeks of in the history of the organization to come out with the 2.0 thing. What do you think that has done to... Because, I mean, they, they're claiming 28, 29,000, and every match I've gone to, there's no chance that's what's there. So I'm just curious what what you think the the trajectory of this season has done to the quality of, like, I guess, maybe not interest or fandom or knowledge in, in, in our city. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't... I don't know if it's necessarily making the chain, like the coaching changes and like messaging issues or whatever. I think it's just that they're bad and no one wants to show up and watch a team that has lost seven games in a row. Um, I, well, I think even in, in years and worse, worse than bad, they're, they're hard ugly, to watch. Ugly. Yeah, I mean, the, for sure. The, and it's, not, I mean, if you're losing four, three, I mean, there, there's a certain value to putting three goals up. Right. I, they're they are legitimately hard to watch sometimes right now and totally and it's just, the, the 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 whole interim period was rough yeah I, I i think that lost a ton of i mean i don't think there was a ton of momentum anyway but i mean they were in a decent place when gary left and they're not in a decent place now when bj callahan is taking over um and I have a little. I have some questions about the timing. Obviously, Callahan was with the U.S. in Copa America, and he was never going to leave before that. So that kind of makes sense once you identified him as your top target. Like maybe he whatever. Have. But it, it's a little <laughs> bit. It, it, it strikes me as a little bit odd that Mike Jacobs was saying after Gary Smith was fired, like the 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 game that Rumba Montali took over. He said we wanted to make the move now while there was still something to play for. Then you take two months to hire your next head coach. You lose seven games in a row. You drop out of the playoff spots. Like. Uh, it, it it doesn't quite the messaging doesn't quite hold consistent throughout all of that. Um, I, I think the way back is just putting out a better team and and winning games. And I think fans will start showing up once the once the team is not fighting. For, I mean, not fighting against relegation because that's not a thing. But once they're not in fourteenth, once they're uh, uh, towards the top of the table or fighting for playoff spots, I think the other t- thing too is like in years past when the team has been getting poor results, at least you could show up to watch Hani Mukhtar because he was still one of the best players in the league and he's fallen off a cliff since last July. Um, so I think winning is winning's not there. And then your biggest kind of on-field draw is not there either. Um, so I, I don't know if it's going to, I don't know if it's going to improve in 2024. I, I think you could potentially with, a, I, I, they're going to have to rebuild some of the roster in the winter. And I think maybe with a new look team um, and kind of more time for Callahan to get things right. I, I think maybe you're looking at a different mood in 2025. Let, let me let me follow up on that. What I mean is is that Titans fans, NFL fans, they check out because the team's bad. It's so much easier to lure them back in with something, whether that's style of play, a new coach, a quarterback, etc. Predators fans are even to some degree like that. In Nashville, in general, is a fair weather city. I would argue. Do you think that this has hurt bigger picture than just the like people like me who are fans of the team who have tickets and want to show up to watch a great team? And we'll probably show up more and make it more appointment. Is it isn't it isn't there a, like a, a harder battle there for MLS versus you know these other these other franchises? Maybe are, are you kind of saying that just because of soccer's kind of position in the country, like where it sits I, with the other leagues? Maybe, maybe I'm just like, do they have to work that much harder to recapture that thing that made this this team and franchise and stadium very interesting for three years? Like it was a very interesting yeah. hot ticket. It was a hot team. It culminated with the Leagues Cup and Messi in town last year. And then it seems like they've been slowly leaking ever since, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I think maybe. I don't think there's a way to know unless they start winning a bunch of games and people still aren't showing up. I think the one okay. kind of uh, the one thing that they can fall back on as Nashville is pretty consistently towards like the, the top in terms of like Premier League viewership and stuff like that. So there, there are tons of soccer fans in the city. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's a, a hard pitch for them to be like, hey, we have a playoff caliber team show up. I, I think it's a lot harder to be like, hey, we're in 14th place in the East and we just lost to New England at home. Like show up and watch this. Um, so I, I do think right that. right now, right now, I think I'm, I, I'm still in the camp that kind of like winning is going to fix a lot of a lot of things yeah. for the team. And if maybe if, if that happens and people still don't show up, we can reevaluate. OK. On the other side of. Callahan 
and he's essentially getting a mini. He's essentially getting a mini training camp here. Uh, he's had a few. He's had a few weeks with the team. He's going to get a couple more here before they have to go back into league action because of the cup. What's the best case scenario for them about how they're going to look on the field? What's going to be different? Yeah, I mean, he taught. He's called it controlled aggression a lot, um, and I, I think there's a lot of coach speak that kind of goes on when when a new coach first takes over and obviously they're all going to promise to be like proactive and everything. But like from, from talking to him with him outside of that, like he's really pushing hard for that. Um, they, they, they pressed more. You, you saw it in the two games. Um, I think a lot of that takes time first of all, because you have to kind of implement whole team presses instead of just having one guy do it himself. Cause if one guy presses, he's by himself and no one else says, then you super easy to bypass. Um, so there's some organization. There's also just fitness that comes with it because it's a completely different way of playing. And I think these two weeks will kind of help both of those things. Um, so they're going to be more, more proactive without the ball. I think with the ball is that's where the issues have been, right? Because they haven't been able to play through midfield. Um, Hani Mukhtar has been dropping deeper and deeper and deeper because no one's getting him the ball. Um, so I think a lot of it is going to be him trying to implement a system that lets the midfielders actually progress the ball. That might include personnel changes and i think it probably will this winter so i think whatever you see this year it's going to be the first kind of iteration of his overall plan and i don't think it's going to be the completed picture at all um the, the good news is that there's still only i think three points out of the playoff spots and like 65 percent of the league still makes the playoffs so they, they don't have to be great to get into the playoffs and and their schedule down the stretch is pretty favorable they play a lot of the teams right around them in the table um so even if they get marginal improvement they still could make the playoffs. And I think that's probably best case scenario for, for this year, at least. Can, can you give us like an MLS for those that don't know, it's, it's pretty rare in other sports, although it did happen with the national predators where you fired a coach mid season and then hired a coach mid season, but it wasn't an interim. It was the guy who actually got the job. How, how, how unique was this particular coaching search relative to the rest of the league where you now have your guy for the future in the same season, in which you fired the old guy. Is that fairly normal? Is the time it took very, fairly normal? Kind of give folks that don't know um, how, how unusual or how normal was this particular transition? Yeah, I think in MLS, I mean, in, in soccer in general, I feel like there are more assistant coaches who kind of just take over. Um, so there have been guys who, like Brian Schmetzer was an assistant with the Sounders. He kind of stepped up and immediately took over the job. Um, Wilford Nancy with Montreal was a little bit different because they didn't fire Thierry Henry. He, he left during COVID because he wanted to spend more time with his family he left like two weeks before the season and they just promoted Nancy and he kept the job. Um, but I do think it is a little bit more rare to see like what you said, fire a coach, do a whole coaching search and then bring the guy back in within, within two months um, or sorry, bring a new coach in within two months. You're, Atlanta's kind of doing a similar thing where they, they fired their coach and then Rob Valentino, their interim is going to be the head coach for the rest of the season. So I think that's probably more common, but I, I don't think it's as unheard of as it would be in in other sports. How crucial do you think it was uh, for? And we've kind of hinted around about this about attendance and and kind of uh, activity in the stadium. How crucial is it that they changing from Gary to someone else, someone who is notedly not a defensive coach, so that Next year, you, you're doing all of this as a nod to next year. Everybody, everybody from uh, from front office to Callahan himself says, you know, this is not a this is not a quick fix sort of thing. How much of that is a uh, okay? We need season ticket season ticket renewals, which by the way just began. Uh, <laughs> how much of that is is we need to have people excited about um, about this in order to fill the stadium next year? I think it's a lot of it. Um, I mean, attendance hasn't been great. They're, and like you said, Braden, they're not announcing it, but just from the eye test, it's been significantly lower than what they're actually announcing. Um, I, they still kind of have that 23,000, whatever it is, season ticket holder base to fall back on. So I think they're they're kind of safe from a just income standpoint as far as ticket sales go. Um, I, I think probably bigger than that, though, is just recruitment um, because it's hard to bring in kind of top, young exciting players when you're like when your pitches come to nashville and play defensive soccer and probably don't develop a ton and make a lateral move when you leave 
that, 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 wait, that that's not exciting for for players. Yeah, yeah, believe believe it or not, that's kind of not what anybody has on their vision board when they're when they're charting out their career path. Um, but I think they really I just, want. I could just see somebody with the whiteboard. It's like park bus, uh, make lateral move, lack of development, make that's lateral what pass. For. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> so I, I mean, it was really hard. I think under Gary Smith to recruit exciting young players because I mean. First of all, he wasn't playing a ton of young players anyway. Um, and really, I think to play under Gary Smith, you had to be pretty much developed or toward close to your peak or, or your, your prime years or how, whatever you want to call it. Um, just because it didn't seem like he was giving a ton of kind of development projects a chance. Um, and I think whether it was Callahan or someone else, that I mean, that's one of the main... Ian Air, Mike Jacobs, uh, John Ingram, everybody I've talked to has said like kind of unprompted even before you talk style of play, like player development is, was their number one priority. Um, being able to not just take Academy kids, but I mean, guys like Ake Loba or Rodrigo Pinero, those types of guys who are younger attacking players who are certainly not finished products, but have pretty high potential. Um, they want to be able to bring those guys in, actually get them on the field, um, develop them for two, three years, and then hopefully sell them on for a profit. Um, and they tried, I think, two times with Loba and Pinero, and you saw both of those guys show up in Nashville with I mean, certainly with kind of holes in their game, but hardly saw the field, really kind of publicly fell out and then left. And Loba kind of hasn't recovered. I think Pinero has a little bit more. But, I mean, that's not really a sustainable model in global soccer, and certainly not in MLS when you have a salary cap. Um, when you have pretty significant spending limitations, when you have roster limitations, and when probably 20 of the 29 teams are doing a better job than you at developing players and kind of uh, getting um, getting value from different parts of the roster. And I don't think it was sustainable for Nashville. Um, and theoretically, under Callahan, that should be fixed just because of his background with Philadelphia's academy, um, developing players in Philadelphia um, who have been one of the best teams in MLS to do it. And he's, you've already seen it just kind of with the young players that he's played um, bring up guys like Jordan Knight from Huntsville. Who's actually seen the field. I don't think that would have ever happened under Gary Smith. Um, Forrester Ajago is playing a ton more. I, I think Rumo Monthali started that, but I kind of imagine that was because they knew who was coming in. Um, so I, I think that's kind of where it's trending. And, and I think that's, one of, if not the biggest priority for Nashville, um, kind of making this move. Is there anybody who's not playing for their job for next year? Yeah, I don't think, I think there's some guys who are pretty safe. Um, I mean, Hani just signed a, Hani Mokhtar just signed a fat new contract extension at the beginning of the year. He's, I think the ninth highest paid player in the league. Um, and even though he hasn't been great since last July, I mean, he's still, I would put him at one of the 10 best kind of number number 10s in MLS. And he's not someone that you just kind of get rid of. Um, I think Walker Zimmerman's probably safe. He has kind of an extensive background with Callahan at the national team. And I mean, he's been really banged up, but I think when healthy, he's still probably a, a top two or three center back. Um, Sam Surridge, I think he's safe. Jacob Schaffelberg, uh, if anything, I, I think he's, he's been the best about. player. He's the thing the to worry about with him is that he, yeah, the thing to worry about with him is that someone from Europe comes in and tries to buy him in the winter. Um, so I think those uh, Sam Surridge is probably safe. Shaq Moore. Um, I think a lot of those guys are n maybe not like guaranteed starters every single game next year, but I, they're going to be around for sure. And I think a lot of the younger guys too, that you started to see come up um, Forster, Jago, Josh Bauer, um, those type of guys, I, I think they're something to build around and continue to improve. So you 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 just took a uh, you just signed up with uh, Give Me Sport. Of course, you're going to be writing, kind of covering all of the MLS. Um, you already write for Backheeled and as well as MLSsoccer.com. I I'm curious. So number one, um, tell everybody about Give Me Sport, what it is, what the goal, what the goal is. But also, ha have you have you seen any changes in your own opinions of Nashville SC through the lens of covering the entire league already? That's an interesting question. Um first of all give me sport um they're a pretty big outlet in europe especially in england with the premier league and i have a pretty big audience there and i think it's what we're seeing hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more in the next two years um people around the world realizing 
first of all, that the World Cup is coming here in, in two years, and that's a huge opportunity. But also soccer is is growing pretty fast. And I think the MLS is kind of um, eating up more real estate kind of in the sports landscape, maybe not a ton, but I think it's slowly growing. Um, and so it, it does feel like a, a cool opportunity to see kind of what happens in the next few years. Um, and, and I think it's one example of what I hope is kind of more investment into coverage of, of soccer. So right now it's pretty early. It's um, Tom Bogert and myself are, I think, the only two writers that we have um, right now. But it, we're building out the team pretty quickly. Um, and I think it's going to be we're, we're going to be doing some cool stuff, not just with MLS, but kind of U.S. soccer in general. Um, as far as Nashville SC, I think, um, first of all, despite the last two months or whatever, I think the fan base in Nashville is still pretty impressive, especially when you look around the league. Uh, maybe not all older teams, but a lot of the teams that have been around from the start of the league, um, it, they're struggling. And I think you're seeing kind of what happens if you have kind of an MLS 1.0 approach in an NFL stadium um, and don't have a good product on the field. I think like New England and Chicago and, and teams like that, it, it's pretty rough and there's not necessarily an end a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so I think I've just realized that even, even though things on the field aren't great in Nashville, just kind of the, the vibes around the team are significantly better than they are other places. Um, I, th I think too, with Gary Smith and now BJ Callahan, I, I think we've got lucky with coaches who are pretty good with media. Um, even just, talking to media i think there are plenty of coaches who i'm on press conferences with that are just you can tell they have plenty of other things they would rather be doing and their answers reflect that and, and so it's just it's hard to get real solid answers and whatever you want to say about gary he was pretty thoughtful with his answers even if he was kind of uh biting back at you a little bit um and i think callahan is, is setting up that way so i think that's from a media perspective i i think Nashville has got pretty lucky with two coaches who are um, seen, so far have been fairly easy to work with. And at least um, if you ask them a thoughtful question, they'll give you a thoughtful answer back. Have you had a chance to talk to Gary since he left? No, I haven't. I, I would, I would, I would love to read anything uh, with him and, and, and how he spent his summer. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I know. Because... I, I think he's still in Nashville. He is still in, he is still in town. He was he was in Germany watching them not win a tournament. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask you real quick while uh, while we had you here, there were rumors going around this this week um, about at, about MLS potentially going in with a uh, on a women's league post twenty twenty seven World Cup, uh, which would give us three division one. Uh, or or top flight uh, women's leagues in America. Uh, do you have any, any put any credence to this, or is this just uh, is this just corners of the internet bullshit? I, I think that the story that came out last week was kind of pretty. I mean, it was retracted pretty quickly. So yeah. I, I think that should that should tell you something about it. Um, I think it's, gone, it's gone great for boxing, guys. It's gone great. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's definitely definitely interest from MLS in the women's side of the game. Um, I know like John Ingram has talked about in the past wanting to bring a women's team to Nashville. I think there are plenty of there's definitely overlap between some MLS and NWL. I don't know if it's I mean, this is just me. Like I'm not reporting anything here. I don't know if it's realistic for MLS to start its own thing. I, I would kind of expect a lot. I think it's more likely that you see come some sort of partnership or, or even a merger down the road. Um, but yeah, I would be, I would be surprised if they're trying to start a third first division league. Uh, just exactly. feels like a mess. I, I would be stunned if the, uh, I would be stunned if the people that pioneered single entity in America were su suddenly wanted to get into a competitive situation with multiple <laughs> leagues. Yeah. I think it's much more likely that there's some sort of, sort of partnership um, down the road with NWSL or even the USL super league, something like that. Um, so we just saw a coach make a dramatic impact on our national team in a very short period of time. Emma Hayes takes over and U S women's national team loaded with 22, 24, 26 year olds. Uh, the next generation and next wave of star talent, um, goes on and, and wins a gold medal. Uh, you know, improbably is not necessarily the right term. They weren't the favorite, but they're also pretty damn good. Most of the time, 
and the right and the right coach did the right things and got them into the right position and um uh, Mallory Swanson was insane. <laughs> so yeah. um so it was all so were all the other really good young players with with Germa and Rodman and and Sophia Smith etc. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious what did you learn from watching the women's team the last 2 or 3 months? about what the men need to accomplish over the course of the next two years before the women, before the world cup comes to America in 26. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. I think there for, I mean, there's some pretty major differences. First of all, I think I would put the U S women's team closer to like England on the men's side of the game, just as far as like having an established league, having some of the best talent in the world, because as, as bad as it's been on the men's side, I mean, NWSL has been kind of the top league in, the certainly the most kind of uh solid and functional league in women's soccer for a long time i think you're seeing europe kind of catch up with it now but they've had a head start on everybody um like emma hayes talked about how the u.s kind of made her as a coach she came over before there was really an established women's league in england and kind of developed as a coach over here um kind of like you would expect with england on the men's side of the game so i think even though the rest of the world has kind of caught up a lot i think we still have a head start on everybody else as far as developing players, teams, kind of a competitive culture. Um, and so I think that helped first because there was no game that we went into where we were at a talent disadvantage. Sure. And I think you see that pretty much every game that the U.S. will play outside of the knockout, outside of the, the group stage, they will be the underdog. And I don't, that's not going to happen with the women. Um, I mean, I, I do think they went out. Emma Hayes is the best coach in the women's game right now, and they went out and got the best coach in the game um, and, and paired it with a really good roster. But getting good coaching, even in a short space of time, I think she was there like on the job for two-ish weeks before they really started playing real games. Um, so, yeah, like swinging big, I, I think you, you, if you take nothing else, like take a big swing with the U.S. men's team and see what happens. Um, but I don't think it's just with the player pool and kind of the current talent available, I don't think it's quite as easy as just get a good coach and, and you'll be a good team. I think they have a lot of work to do. And I think I, I kind of, what I expect is you'll see similar results under whoever they bring in, because I, I think we have overestimated the the men's player pool pretty significantly. And think just because these guys are on the rosters of some top teams in, in Europe that we should be one of the best 10 15 teams in the world when in reality we have maybe two or three guys like Christian Pulisic and Anthony Robinson and kind of sporadically Weston McKinney who are actually like important players for their club teams at a high level and the rest are kind of just rotational players and, and so I think until you, we get past that and have guys who are like carrying the weight of like their team's expectations week in and week out I don't think we're going to see a significant improvement just from the from the men's team. Who would you like to see as the U.S. coach? What are what are the who are your two favorites? Two favorites. Um, I what? people are going to hate this. I really want to see Gareth Southgate. Um, first, for you're the, right. I, you're right. I hate that. <laughs> I, I, so selfishly, I do think it would be funny because he checks all the boxes that everybody wants. He has experience at the highest levels. He's he hasn't won, but he's he's improved England. He's got to finals, and they would still be angry. Um, at the higher, which would just kind of crack me up. But I, I do think he, the, the team, internet, w- the internet would have a field day with that. They would love it. And yeah. I would love it too. Um, I don't think he plays attractive soccer, but it works at the international level. And I think kind of a lot of what he, what his England teams have done well, kind of fits the player pool. Um, they, they defend well, they're decent in transition. Um, they, they get by without like a super functional midfield. Um, and, and so I think a lot of that kind of lines up. Um, I don't want to see Wilfred Nazi just because I think you saw Greg Berhalter run into a lot of issues in the first year or so that he was overcomplicating everything. And I just, I think Nazi is like an elite club coach and I think he's going to be in Europe within the next year or two. And I just don't see that working when you have players for three weeks at the most. Um, so I, I, I think that you need someone who, if they don't have experience at the international level, who is able to play a, a pretty, not like dumbed down system, but be able yeah. to play a system that kind of translates to the international level. How, how much, cause you mentioned how many players that aren't necessarily like full-time club contributors. There, there are a handful of the very young players that could develop into that over the course of the next few years. How much is that a factor into what they do? Or is, 
is that not necessarily this head coach's job? Like, how, how much is that a factor? Yeah, I don't think it's really the job of any national team coach because you have guys for a handful of maybe like in a World Cup year at most, maybe four weeks. And like they're not going to be significantly like developing these players long term. I think that's more mostly down to like their club teams and their club coaches. Um, I think it's more about kind of identifying talent, finding like a place in your system for them, and then just kind of uh, giving them instructions in really easy digestible ways that they can actually take and run with it in in a short space of time it's a completely different i mean it's it's basically a completely different job description than coaching a club team and so i don't think it's definitely not for the u.s but really for any national team i don't think it's a co- a national team coach's job to develop his young players how, how much should mls owners be and maybe even fans for that matter be invested in the u.s's performance in 26 I I think they should be like super invested just because it's the biggest kind of showcase for U S soccer that we're going to have that we've had since 1994. And there wasn't even MLS didn't start until 1996. So there wasn't kind of a domestic league to, um, to kind of grow with the, with a 94 world cup. Um, but like legitimately everybody in the world is going to be watching soccer in the U S in, in two years. Um, they're going to be seeing players who, who play in MLS. You're going to be seeing, a lot of the markets that MLS team is playing. Um, I think if the U S it does really well, I mean, it'll, it'll just bring more attention to MLS. It'll bring a bunch of young kids who, who are like are excited about soccer and want to keep watching it. And I think if they do badly, I don't, I don't think it's going to hurt MLS, but I don't think it's going to, I think it, the worst case, it probably stays where it is now. But but, but what can they do though? Like uh, outside of writing a job. Oh of bill- yeah. That outside I mean, of bill- write a check. Outside of billionaires writing a big check for a great coach or something, like I'm just curious what what's the strategy to use it and then capitalize on the interest? Like what? What's well, I the think that's what they're strategy? trying to figure out. That's what they're trying to figure out now. And like, how do you turn how do you turn people who are t- tuning in now to watch Messi into fans after he leaves? And I don't know if they have an answer for that um, because you you can already see kind of Miami attendance when Messi isn't playing. Um, yeah. That worries me a little bit. Um, His name is Harry Kane. <laughs> Gosh, hey, uh, I've it, won as many trophies as him. Look, look, I, I have a, I have a lifetime, uh, I have a lifetime of watching at least one Miami team. Uh, let me tell you, th- those fan bases, are, unless you're winning something, unless you're winning a title, th- those fan bases down there are not great anyway. But I mean, my, Miami is like maybe the best team in MLS right now, even without Messi, though. Yeah, and and Nashville, Nashville. and Nashville's not that different than Miami from a fair weather standpoint just to be fair yeah. as a as a whole sports town not soccer but holistically so I, I think the big thing is like getting people to tune in and watch on tv regularly like even yeah. more than showing up at games just because of how much they've how much they've put into this apple tv deal and kind of how much they're banking on that um but also like u.s tv numbers for soccer in general are phenomenal and there's just a gap between soccer and mls specifically and i think if they can figure out a way to improve those numbers even even marginally over the next two years i i think that that should be the priority for them and and i don't know if that looks like presenting in a different way um figuring out different ways to um kind of just tweak their packaging or whatever or find some ways to tie that in with u.s games or i don't don't know how they do it but i think that kind of is where more than getting fans into the stadium I, i think it's going to be getting people to tune in like on a weekly basis to actually watch yeah I, I don't know what if I don't know if it's gimmicky. I don't know what, but they need to have a strategy for something to be promoted throughout that event and to be put in place afterward that lures people into TV mark TV viewership and stadiums. And I, I think don't... probably it ends up being owners writing checks to sign players. Yep. Who yep. I mean, like it, it'd be it'd be the type of thing like this guy just won a World Cup. You can come watch him in your backyard seven yep. times a year. Yep. And, and so I think it's going to be that like. I think really the only way MLS takes a huge step forward is if you completely rewrite the just archaic roster rules that they have and let teams actually spend money. Senior soccer correspondent for the internet. Ben, thank you so much. Uh, We do appreciate your time today. Thanks for hanging out, man. Thank you. Yeah, this was a ton of fun. Thanks for having me on.